This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the worship and fellowship of the Delisle Community Chapel. Our psalm today is 62, selected verses, and we read, Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. One thing God has spoken. Two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they have done. We pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of gathering on this cold winter day. We ask that the warmth of your love would ignite our hearts so that we would love as you love. Help us to worship you today in spirit and in truth, so that Jesus Christ will be honored and glorified. In his name we pray. Amen.
The assigned scripture today comes from the minor prophet, Jonah. We're going to be going through the little book of Jonah this morning and learning some truths that are going to help us in our life. But our particular reading at this moment is Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and then also verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. 
The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, I want to read verse 38 to 41 of chapter 12. Here we find Jesus making reference to Jonah. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now someone greater than Jonah is here. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, today, as I said, we want to talk about Jonah. And uh, Jonah is, uh, is quite a character and uh, someone from whom we can learn a lot. Some of the things that we learn from Jonah are a little hard to swallow. In fact, I entitled the message today, The Hard to Swallow Truth. I was uh, about 16 years of age when I had the privilege of attending a youth retreat at what was then called Miller Memorial Bible Institute, now called Miller College of the Bible. I think it was Al Shostel that drove some of us down for that retreat. And I uh, was billeted in a dorm room there with a student, a Bible college student at that time by the name of Cecil McNee. He was a bit of a guitarist and a poet, and uh, he had a poem that he read about Jonah. And uh, I liked it so much that I, uh, I memorize it. Now, I won't strum a guitar as I share the poem with you like he did, but uh, actually I remembered a good part of the poem, and then my wife did a little searching online, and she found at least a version of the whole thing. I think there's probably several versions of it out there. But it's the story of Jonah and the whale, and it goes something like this. Now listen, my children, and I'll tell you a tale about a prophet named Jonah got caught by a whale. The whale caught poor Jonah, and bless your dear soul, he not only caught him, but he swallowed him whole. This part of the story is awfully sad, for it tells of a city that went to the bad. When God saw the city had such wicked ways, he said, I'll allow him yet 40 more days. The Lord spoke to Jonah, and he said, go and cry to that sin-hardened city and tell him just why. I'll give them six weeks to get well humbled down, and if they don't yield, I'll tear up their town. Jonah heard the Lord speaking, and he said, I won't go. It's against my religion, and so I say no. Those Nineveh people are nothing to me, and I'm always against foreign missions, you see. So he went down to Joppa, defiant in face, and he boarded a ship for a faraway place. But the Lord saw the ship as it sailed and said, He, I can see Jonah's planning to run off on me. He set the winds blowing with squeaks and with squeals, and the sea became rowdy and kicked up its heels. When Jonah confessed it was all for his sin, the crew threw him out, and the whale took him in. The whale said, old fellow, now don't you forget, I'm sent here to take you in out of the wet. Now you will get punished, all right, for your sin. So he opened his mouth, and old Jonah went in. On beds of green seaweed, the fish tried to rest, as he sought for some sleep that his food might digest. But he got mighty restless and very perturbed as the prayers of the prophet inside him were heard. The third day that fish rose up from his bed, with his stomach tore up and a pain in his head. And he said, I must get to the air mighty quick, for this filthy backslider is making me sick. <laughs> he winked his big eyes and wiggled his tail and pulled for the shore to deliver his mail. He stopped near the shore and looked all around and vomited Jonah right up on the ground. Old Jonah, Jonah thanked God for his mercy and grace 
and turning around to the whale, made a face, and he said, After three days I guess you have found a praying man, fella, it's hard to keep down. He stretched himself out with a yawn and a sigh, and then he sat down in the sun for his clothing to dry. He thought how much better his preaching would be since from Whale Seminary he had a degree. When he had rested and dried in the sun, he started for Nineveh, fast on the run. He thanked his dear father in heaven above for his tender mercy and wonderful love. And though he was now nearly three days too late, he preached from the time that he entered the gate, till the whole population repented and prayed, and the hand of God's justice and vengeance was stayed. So, when tempted to sin, remember this tale. If you run from God's call, look out for God's whale. <laughs> well, you know, this story is probably one of the better known stories from the Old Testament of the Bible. I was tempted to, uh, to say something like it's a whale of a tale, but my wife doesn't like when I make corny jokes, so I won't say that. I won't say that this is a story about a fish story about the one that got away. Or that the moral of the story is catch and release. <laughs> the fact is that this actually is a true story. It's not just an allegory, as some people have claimed. Um, if you have been watching television lately, you may have seen the, uh, the ad for the uh, throat lozenges, Fisherman's Friend, where the old, the old fisherman says, I caught a shark so big and had a terrible cough. And, uh, you know, it coughed so hard that it spit out my long last brother. And it was my brother had the cough. So anyway, he gives him fisherman's friend and that cures the cough. And, and he says, and that's the truth. Well, that's hard to swallow. But today I do want to share with you some hard to swallow truths from the book of Jonah. Actually, Jonah was an 8th century BC, before the time of Christ, prophet the son of Amittai, from a town called Gath-Hefer. And uh, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14 and 25, it actually makes reference to Jonah as the prophet of God. He had prophesied that the nation of Israel would actually expand during the reign of Jeroboam II. And in fact, that is what happened. Jonah was an authentic prophet. But now he is being given a new assignment. He is to go to Nineveh, the capital of the nation of Assyria, present-day Iraq, and he is to deliver God's message. The fact that Jonah is a real person and not just an imaginary figure is also strengthened by the fact that Jesus himself referred to him on at least two different occasions, and he compared Jonah's three days and nights in the belly of the fish to the three days and nights that he would spend in death before his resurrection. Well, let's take a fresh look at the book of Jonah. It's just four short chapters, and uh, we're going to draw a truth from each chapter. Now, although this story is commonly referred to as Jonah and the whale, uh, actually, the scripture doesn't say that it was a whale. It says that it was a great fish that God had prepared for Jonah. Maybe it was a, a great white shark. We don't know. Or perhaps it was a creature that God prepared specifically for this occasion. The story, in fact, is more about spiritual principles than it is about fish. And that's the hard-to-swallow truth. In Jewish synagogues, the book of Jonah is read on Yom Kippur the highest holy day of the year. Why is that? Because of the spiritual truths that it teaches. So, first of all, the hard-to-swallow truth about disobedience. Chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. That's God's command to Jonah. And what is Jonah's response? Verse 2 tells us, Jonah ran away from the Lord 
and headed for Tarshish. Tarshish was in the opposite direction. He went down to Joppa, that was the seaport, where he found a ship bound for Tarshish. After paying the fare, he went on board and sailed from, for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. I couldn't help but notice uh, that little phrase in there, after paying the fare. It always costs when you disobey God. And now, we might assume that Jonah fled in the opposite direction because he was afraid of the people in Nineveh, the Assyrians. And he would have had reason to be afraid. If you uh, read history, the Assyrians were some of the most cruel conquerors that you could ever imagine. They have often been referred to as the world's first terrorists. They would use terror to, uh, to frighten people into submission. And they would do horribly cruel things to the people that they conquered. Uh, there is a stone pillar in which an Assyrian king inscribed what he had done to his enemies. And I'm not even going to read it because it's, it's very descriptive and it's, and it's very terrible. So you could understand if Jonah's reason for running in the opposite direction was that he was afraid of, of the Assyrians. But it's interesting that the Bible says that Jonah ran away not from Nineveh, but from the Lord, according to verse 10. Anyway, Jonah gets on the boat, the ship sets sail, and a terrible, unnatural storm comes up. What was Jonah's sin? It's what I like to call the big WD, willful disobedience. He knew perfectly well what God wanted him to do, and he said no, and he ran in the opposite direction. And there was consequences. Some of you are familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You may have read the book, particularly when you were younger, or you may have read it to your children. Great book. And uh, it's also made into a movie, which some of you have seen. In that um, movie and book, there is uh, a figure, a lion, by the name of Aslan, who represents Jesus. And, of course, uh, Lucy, one of the children, uh, in inquiring about Aslan, this, this great lion, says, is he dangerous? And the response is, of course he's dangerous, but he's good. And, you know, our God is dangerous. It's dangerous to disobey him. There are consequences. But God is also good. God is our friend. But sometimes we try to misuse that friendship. We act as if God was buddy-buddy and because he loves us we can get away with anything. When we are disobedient we can actually experience God's wrath. The fact is that so much of the pain and trouble that we as humans face is because of our disobedience to God. Jesus gave this command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Ask God to give you an obedient spirit. So anyway, Jonah gets on the ship. The storm comes up. The sailors are terrified. They've never seen a storm like this. They all start to pray to whatever gods they knew. The captain goes to Jonah, finds him asleep, and says, How can you sleep? Get up. Call on your God. Maybe he will take notice on us so that we will not perish. And uh, so the sailors try to figure out who it is that's caused this problem. And they asked Jonah, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? 
from what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, that is Yahweh, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew that he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them that. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked them, what should we do to make the sea calm down? And Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it's all my fault, and that this great storm has come upon you because of me. Well, the sailors were reluctant to throw him overboard. They did their best to continue on, but they couldn't do it. The sea grew even wilder than before, and so they cried out, to the Lord. And they said, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to him. Notice, Jonah was a powerful witness to these men, even though he was in the process of being disobedient. God can bring a good result, even when we do wrong. Well, let's move on to chapter 2. In chapter 2, we find the hard-to-swallow truth about prayer. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now, why is it that we're so often like Jonah? We wait until we're in a terrible spot, usually a problem of our own making, before we get serious about prayer. In his distress, Jonah called to the Lord. He says, and he answered me. From the realm of the dead, I called for help, and he listened to my cry. I said, I've been banished from your sight. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountain I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. He thought this was the end. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you. And then Jonah says, With shouts of grateful praise I will sacrifice you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Aren't you glad that when we are disobedient to God, he just doesn't stop hearing our prayers. Even when we've gone in the wrong direction, it's never too late to pray. You can pray anywhere, anytime, because God is always there, always present, all the time. As a result of Jonah's prayer, God commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I think it's so interesting that all of nature listens to God's commands. The sea, the wind, respond to God's command. The great fish responded to God's command. And as we'll see a little later in the book of Jonah, even the plant responds to God's command. Even a worm responds to God's command. It's only we humans who have problems responding to God's commands. Only sinful human beings. Well, let's move on to chapter 3, where we find the hard-to-swallow truth about 
repentance. After Jonah is delivered from the whale, put back on dry land, Scripture tells us the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Aren't you glad that God gives second chances? And sometimes third chances. Many chances. God's word to Jonah was this. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. The same assignment that he'd had to begin with. I read a story about a man named Harry Sheffield. This happened on May 7, 1996. Harry had been selected to be one of the people to carry the Olympic torch, which was being uh, taken um, in a relay to Atlanta that year. It was a 1,500-mile Olympic torch relay, and uh, Harry Sheffield was carrying the torch in a special bracket on his bicycle. He was actually in the process of crossing a bridge in Washington State when the rear tire of his bicycle blew out. He lost control of the bike, crashed, and people all over the world who were watching on television viewed with horror as the Olympic flame went out. But there was a van that followed along behind the person carrying the torch, and they were well prepared to handle the situation. Inside the van, they had another flame, the mother flame, from which they relit the torch and the relay went on its way. Harry Sheffield actually got quite a bit of coverage out of that, even got to show up on the Jay Lennon show. Well, I think there's a lesson from Harry too. When you repent, that is, when you turn around and agree with God about your sin and go in a different direction, God will rekindle the flame. Once again, you can be, as it were, on fire for Jesus. Jonah received a second call. And this time, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Chapter 3, verse 3. And what was the result? when Jonah went in and proclaimed the message from God. Verse 5 tells us, The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. That was a way of showing their repentance. And what was the result of their repentance? Verse 10, When God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now, if that was the end of the story, we would say it had a happy ending, didn't it? The Ninevites were saved as a result of their belief and repentance. But there's a fourth chapter to this little book of Jonah. And chapter 4 teaches us the hard-to-swallow truth about God's love. To Jonah, this seemed very wrong. That he had preached destruction and God had relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah thought it wasn't fair. It made him look bad, for one thing. And he became very angry. Angry that God withdrew the promised judgment on Nineveh. Have you ever noticed that people get angry at God when he doesn't do things the way they would if they were God? <laughs> Thank God he doesn't do things the way we would. Jonah is actually mad because God is gracious, compassionate, and loving. In fact, that's what he says. Jonah says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. 
I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that about you, God. That's why I ran away. Remember I told you you couldn't have blamed Jonah if he ran away because he was afraid of the Assyrians in Nineveh? The fact is, he ran away because he didn't like the fact that God was loving and compassionate. He's mad. I knew you were like that. Here's the real reason Jonah ran away in the first place. Not because he was afraid of the Assyrians, but because he was afraid that they would repent and God wouldn't destroy them. Jonah wanted the Ninevites destroyed. Now, we might wonder, was God being inconsistent in what he did? I found a passage in Jeremiah's prophecy, chapter 18, verses 7 to 10, that really helped to understand what he's doing here. This is what God told the prophet Jeremiah. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if that nation does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Makes sense, doesn't it? It does make sense when you understand the love of God. He is looking for a response that makes it possible for him to be compassionate. But Jonah pouts. In fact, he has a real hissy fit. And so God gives him an object lesson. When Jonah pouts so badly that he says, it's better for me to die than to live, the Lord replies, is it right for you to be angry? Well, Jonah goes out and sits down outside the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade, and he waited to see what would happen. He was still hoping that God would send fire and brimstone and destroy Nineveh. But while he's sitting there, the Lord God provided a leafy plant, some kind of a vine. He made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Now that felt good. Sitting out there in the desert, having this leafy vine grow up so quickly and one day cover him with its shade. Wow, that was nice. And it says Jonah was very happy about the plant. You know, some people are more concerned about their geraniums than they are about their neighbors. Anyway, at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. I love this. You know, a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head. He may have had a haircut like mine so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Well, God speaks to Jonah again. He says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah said. And I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And if you're concerned about a plant, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, in other words, children, who don't know the difference yet, and also many animals. God is concerned even for the animals. 
I mentioned that the Jewish people read this little book of Jonah on Yom Kippur, their holiest day. One rabbi explained it this way. He said, God cares for everyone. Jonah cares only for himself. God wins. God always wins. Love always wins. God loves you. We like that, don't we? That makes us feel good. But the hard to swallow truth about God's love is that God loves your enemies too. That's the hard part. God tells us to love other people, even our enemies. Remember, while we were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us. Because he loves our enemies, we must love them too. We should love everyone that God loves. In Matthew chapter 5, we find Jesus speaking. And this is what he has to say, uh, beginning with verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In other words, love your enemies like your heavenly Father does. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you only love those who love you, what reward will you get? And so today, we pray. Father God, Give us a willing heart to obey you. Remind us to pray always and not just in times of trouble. When we fail, and we do fail, give us grace to repent, to confess our sin and begin anew. Pour your love into our lives so that we can love others as Jesus loves even our enemies. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes the whole earth shakes I see his love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people sing The people sing Hosanna Hosanna
open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how a love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk in through the to eternity Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna 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 in the highest Santa in the highest. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, as we come into your presence, we are so grateful that you hear and answer prayers. Thank you that we can pray to you anytime about anything, wherever we are. Today, Father, I want to praise you for all the great things that you have done. And for just being the wonderful, loving God that you are. God, you know our, our situations. We pray for our families, our marriages, our children. We lift up to you our, our friends and make, ask that you would make our friendship strong and loving and beautiful. Lord, we, we pray for our neighbors. We ask that uh, we would be a blessing to them, that we would show them your love through our words and our actions. We pray for our church. We ask that you would keep us united during this time when we are separated. We ask that you would keep us close to Jesus, for when we are close to Jesus, we're also close to one another. We pray for our community. We ask that those who are responsible for our local government would handle things wisely, and we thank you for the good job that they're doing. We pray for those who give leadership to our province and to our nation and to all nations, God, and to all people, regardless of race or even religion. You love everyone, and we thank you for that. And we ask your blessing today upon every church and every individual who shares the love of Jesus Christ in words and in actions. So God... We ask that the things that have been shared today would continue to make a difference in our hearts. We ask that the word that has now gone out over Facebook and YouTube would continue to be seen and heard and that your spirit would continue to work in the lives of the people who get that message. Father, during this very coldest part of our Canadian winter, we pray for safety. We ask God that you would provide shelter, that your people would do their part to provide shelter for those who need help. We pray, God, that our heating systems would work well and safely. We pray that you would provide all of our needs according to your riches in glory through Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.
spirit strong in me and my flesh may fail but my God you never will benediction brothers and sisters may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit now and forever. Amen. Thank you.